Bienvenidos a New Dentists on the Block. Welcome to New Dentists on the Block, a podcast featuring new dentists sharing their experiences in the world of dentistry, successes, challenges, and life in between, navigating dentistry together one experience at a time. We're closing out Hispanic Heritage Month with Dr. Diego Rivas. Diego was born in Caracas, Venezuela, and moved to Texas at a young age. From a young age, he knew he wanted to go into healthcare. Now he's a pediatric dental resident in New York City who is very passionate about education for underserved communities. He hopes to empower his Latino community to take control of their oral and overall health. Let's get into today's episode. Diego Rivas, welcome to New Dentist on the Block. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat with you and to have you on the podcast and uh, to let all our listeners know who you are and and what you're doing in life. But let, let's start there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling me and our listeners um, who you are. Sure. So my name is Diego Rivas. I, um, I'm a new graduated dentist. I just graduated in May and I started a pediatric residency uh, in New York. So I, I went to dental school at UT Health of Houston and um, and glad, glad to have graduated. And now I'm just moving forward with my new specialty journey. And um, yeah, I, I sort of grew up surrounded by uh, dentistry because my mom is actually a pediatric dentist as well. Um, so cool. yeah, yeah, my mom uh, did dental school in, in Caracas, Venezuela, and she uh, did her, her specialty training here in, uh, at UT Health Houston. So, um, so yeah, I grew up around dentistry and I always loved the profession. I always loved healthcare and that's why I decided to follow in her footsteps. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'm so excited to have you on, on the podcast during this month. You know, happy Hispanic Heritage Month uh, to you, both you and I. Uh, but I would love if you would talk a little bit more maybe about your mom and your upbringing, being uh, having a, a background and a heritage in, um, in Venezuela. Uh, but if, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that, how, how that was and how that was enriched in uh, when you were growing up. Of course. So I was actually born in Caracas, uh, Venezuela, okay, okay. and I was born there. And whenever I was one, I moved away and I moved to actually Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, because of my dad's job. Um, and then from Rio, I moved to the States here to Houston. Whenever I was uh, about six years old, my dad worked in the oil and gas industry, which uh, is a very common profession amongst Venezuelans because Venezuela is a big oil and gas country. So as a result, Houston being the oil and gas capital of the United States, we actually have the um, the second largest Venezuelan community here in Houston after Miami, Florida. So uh, so I definitely grew up around a lot of Venezuelans here in Houston. Um, my parents had a lot of friends. I, I never had any cousins or anything like that living in Houston. It was just like my immediate family unit, my parents, my siblings, and I. An interesting thing about my siblings is that I was born in Venezuela. My sister was born in Brazil. My little brother was born here in Houston. So. Um, so we actually, uh, the three of us were born in different countries. Um, so yeah, we made it to Houston. And um, I think that my parents had a relatively easy time uh, sort of maintaining the Venezuelan culture because there's plenty of Venezuelan bakeries, plenty of Venezuelan people. Um, we celebrated every year uh, a very sort of Latin Caribbean Christmas tradition uh, where uh, everybody gets, it's called, the um, everybody goes to a different person's house every weekend and they play traditional Latin Caribbean Christmas music called yeah. Aguinaldos and Gaitas. And so um, so we all the kids would get instruments and we would sing songs and everybody would dance. And we kind of continue to do that, do that every year with uh, with a lot of our Venezuelan family friends um, and also Colombian family friends and stuff. So, so yeah, so we, um, so I think, uh, and also my parents um, really, really emphasize Spanish, like Spanish language. I only spoke Spanish at home. So I think me having the connection to the Spanish language, being able to speak it fluently has really allowed me to very easily hold on to my Venezuelan culture, my Latin culture, because I think that's a bit, an important part of it. And, um, and, and even my parents would send us back to, to Venezuela every year, back before Venezuela became a very difficult uh, place to go visit. So, so my life has basically been the steady down for my whole entire life. It's, it's, it's pretty much been the very uh, quick and steady downfall of Venezuela. So mm-hmm. ever since I was little, Venezuela has been on a very steep decline. And now, you know, Venezuela is suffering a economic, social, yeah. and political crisis. Um, and so I haven't returned to Venezuela in over, I think, 12 years. But growing up my whole life, I would go every single summer. Sometimes we would even go December and summer. So it was nice that I got to see it in my youth. And unfortunately, now because of the regime, it's not possible. But uh, yeah, there's no more diplomatic ties between the U.S. and Venezuela even. So, um, so it's been a difficult process being a Venezuelan in, um, in America, just knowing that my country has gone to SHIT. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, for, for real. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is, it is so sad to watch uh, what Venezuela and the people of Venezuela have had to kind of endure. It's, it's just, it's really sad. And you know, we, we know a lot of Venezuelans, right? There are a lot of Venezuelans in Houston. So I, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting so many when I was in Houston in dental school as well, too. And it's so hard that so many express similarly like yourselves that they're not able to go back and visit and many, many still have family members over there and they're not able to see them and that's just really sad but I love that you know your, your parents instilled and enriched you all with uh, the cultures and the traditions of the holidays um, moving forward into your adult life is that something that you foresee yourself continue to embrace? Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be really important for me uh, to, I, I continue to embrace, yeah, sort of the Venezuelan culture, uh, Venezuelan musical styles. Um, I know how to make arepas and I try to yeah. make them and, and I love to make them actually for my friends. And sometimes like whenever I host a dinner night at my house, I always make it like a cultural dinner night where I make like Venezuelan food for everybody. So I think that that's like kind of a cool way for me to share my culture with others. Um, and yeah, and, and being able to share also with my partner, showing him like different kinds of uh, Venezuelan music and telling him about, he, he loves to learn Spanish and so telling him like Venezuelan expressions and uh, different ways that we, different words that we use for different things and stuff like that. Very cool. And for you, moving to New York, was that a big culture shock for you? Or have you found that you have found it to be very accepting? You know, similarly to Houston, I'm assuming it's a very big melting pot. Uh, but I've only visited New York, so I, living in it, I, I would love to know what your experience has been. Oh, wow. So I, I've always dreamed of living to New York ever since I was 15. I've always dreamed yeah. of moving there. And so I kind of, you know, manifested, oh, I'm going to go, I've always wanted to move there. And so it just worked out so perfectly that I was accepted to a residency program there. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a residency program in Brooklyn, and I live and work in Brooklyn. And I love it with all my heart. I absolutely, I think the main difference, uh, of course, Houston's a very diverse place. New York, of course, mm-hmm. is an extremely diverse place. The main difference, I think, is the, the, the walkability, the walkable mm-hmm. lifestyle. It's completely yeah. different <laughs> than down here in Texas. Like in, in New York, you just walk outside, and, and everybody's on the street, the community's right in your face because you see the same people on the block and they say hi and, and you go to the store and you see the people that live you know just around the same area and you just walk to get whatever you need and, and take public transport for, for it all and, and that's like a really really great aspect of living there which i love um and i think that um 
now uh, that I'm working in New York, I think in Houston, my, my patient population was mainly just American and, and Hispanic. But in New York, they really just have every, well, in Houston, we have a big Vietnamese population as well. Yes. Um, and a little bit of everything really in Houston. But yeah. uh, the area of, of New York where I'm working, we get patients from, like, we get, like, Yemeni refugees. And we get um, a lot of, like, Bengali patients, patients from the former Soviet Union countries, Uzbeks, uh, Ukrainians, all kinds of people like that. And it's so interesting just uh, getting to see so many different cultures. And, and we get a lot of Haitians as well. So I get to even practice my wow. French, which I love. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course, so many Latino patients. The, the Latino yeah. population in New York, we do get a lot of Venezuelan patients because uh, there's there's a, such a massive influx of Venezuelan immigrants that, uh, that are coming into the U.S. currently. It's, it's quite a crisis, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So we got, I've seen a lot of Venezuelan patients in New York. Um, they've, they've arrived at the border, and a lot of them have been shipped from, from Texas, actually, over to New York. Um, that's been sort of on the news and everything like that. Um, a lot of them live in shelters. And so listening to, uh, to their experiences and their, their kids' experiences has been very, very interesting and eye-opening. I think I was very lucky because my parents came to the U.S. before Venezuela went downhill, mm -hmm. um, or maybe at very early stages. So I never had to suffer with this very difficult immigration process that a lot of Venezuelans are having to suffer with. But yeah, we see, of course, a lot of Mexican uh, people, a lot of Dominican people, a lot of Puerto Rican people, uh, Panamanian, every kind of Latino you can imagine we see over there. So it's great being able to use my Spanish skills with them, too. That's right, that you're, you're keeping that Spanish skill up and, and that you're embracing all the cultures that you meet. Um, yeah. For you, Diego, did, did you always want to be, oh, well, obviously, your, your mom was a pediatric but that doesn't mean you wanted to be a pediatric dentist. Is that always something that you were kind of striving for? So, actually, whenever I started dental school, I really wanted to keep my um, my options open. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do pediatrics. Maybe there's something else in, in dental that I will really like. And and so um, I didn't end up deciding on applying for pediatrics until pretty much came the time where I had to apply for residency. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking and thinking, and pretty much all my mentors from the pediatric department were all like, you need to apply pediatrics. Like, you're yeah. so good with kids. For me, uh -huh. I felt like it came so naturally every time I was in the pediatric clinic. And I loved being in the pediatric clinic. I would have so much fun. I would just like be able to sing and dance and be myself and just be silly with the kids. And then I would come back up to like the, to the adult clinic where we would normally work. And I would be so excited telling my faculty and my, and my classmates yeah. stories about things that happened in bees. And they're all just like, you really should apply to bees, maybe. And I was just like, yeah, maybe I should apply to bees. And I thought on it and thought on it. And then I'm just so happy that I made the decision to go into bees. Like, I really love it. I love like the hospital um, aspect of pediatrics. Like we go to the OR, we do a lot of sedation. I love working in a hospital. Um, so it, it really, it really is great. And, and being in, in New York, wow, there's no shortage of patients. There, we see every sort of syndromic thing you could possibly imagine. People from all over the world, every kind of socioeconomic status. It's, it's everything. We really are getting top-notch training, trauma, a lot of trauma. Kids fall break their teeth all the time. So it really is good. I love it very much. What a great population to have and to learn from. I think that's really great. Um, just the diverse experiences that you're seeing in your residency. Uh, but I want to go back to something that you were just saying uh, because I felt similarly at Houston. I felt that most of the faculty for the most part were very, very encouraging for all of us. Uh, you know, it was tough, obviously. But I feel like a lot of them were very encouraging to maybe like take the next step or you know helping find somebody that they might know to uh, get an associateship. Maybe um, was that your experience as well? Oh yes, like you have no idea. So whenever I was in school, um, one of the faculty members from the pediatric department. So I, I basically was pretty. You know, I was. I would have been okay with staying in Houston for residency, yeah. but my thinking was, you know, it's two years of training. Why not go somewhere far? Yeah, for sure. Um, when am I going to have this opportunity? Most likely I'm going to come back to Texas for like to practice and to work for, you know, so I just, let me go try something different. So I was really applying to a lot of schools, especially in the Northeast because I love the area. And so I kind of communicated that to some of my faculty at the, uh, the PEDS department and all of them started telling me about their, their friends. Oh, I have one friend who's a program director here. I have another friend who's a program director here. And so they actually put me in contact. Like to give you an example, uh, one of the faculty members from um, from Houston, she is very, very good friends with the program director at Stony Brook um, mm -hmm. in Long Island in New York. And so she put me in contact. I ended up actually getting an interview thanks to that connection. Oh, that's awesome. um, yeah. yeah. And I got in contact with the program director, interviewed there, loved it. It's not where I ended up. Um, but but it was really cool to you know to, to get those sorts of connections and and another faculty member was really good friends with the program director at University of Florida in um in a what's the name of the city Gainesville Gainesville Florida so I also was able to um, actually get an interview there too and communicate with the program director there so that was a big big part of my experience yeah uh, what color were you in at Houston I was in yellow clinic okay, what about yeah, you cool. I was in red oh okay yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah you were uh, Dr. Gardner was a uh... yeah yes yeah before she, before she divorced us and moved to, to uh, her role now she's doing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Houston we have different colors for our individual clinics and so you kind of get to know people based on um, what color they were in but I, I don't know I was pleased with my dental school experience it was hard it was difficult but I, I'm pleased that I went to Houston and I feel like I, I made the right choice um, I think Diego that gave us really good clinical training. And, and yeah, now I, sure. kind of, I make comparisons a little bit with a lot of people that went to a lot of the Northeastern schools, which mm -hmm. I think maybe their clinical training is maybe not as strong as some of the Southern schools are. They get mm -hmm. a lot of didactic training, but um, but we really had just a lot more requirements than the people that I know yeah. from UPenn or NYU or Columbia. Um, they they just don't they didn't they didn't really have to do as many clinical requirements as I, I mean I did six root canals after yeah, graduating yeah. dental school, and most people didn't, they didn't even do one. They did them only on mannequin. Mm -hmm. So so that's mm -hmm. kind of yeah, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. I feel like um, I agree the Northern schools have a lot of didactic bases, which is great. So like if we look at Harvard, they go with the medical students for the first two years, and I know that that's um, mm -hmm. for a lot of other schools as well too. But for us, it wasn't like that. They probably struggled twice as much. Uh, but I agree, our, our hands-on clinical skills, I believe that requirements where I mean, they were hard, they were hard, they were hard. everything, especially for, you know, like the COVID generation, but um, we got it done. And I, I felt decently prepared coming out of school to semi know what I was doing. Yeah, definitely. Diego, for you, you posted something on Instagram the other day uh, with a caption as to, you know, what's next in your life. Do you foresee yourself staying in New York or do you want to venture somewhere else or return to Texas? So I think I think I want to return to Texas. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, being in Texas is where I'll be with my family. This is where I grew up. This is where I have like such a huge community of friends. Um, and I, I love Houston. I can definitely see myself practicing here. But I know it's going to be very hard leaving New York because I love yeah, it. So, I, bet. I yeah, love yeah, it so yeah. very much. But it's not easy living in New York. You know, mm -hmm. living there long term. Even though, so everything in New York is harder. It, everything takes longer. Everything's less comfortable. Everything's older. Everything's dirtier. Um, but I think it's worth it because like I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Like I love it so much. But I think living there for for too long or living there for good it could really take its toll. Um, you yes. know, a lot of stress. Uh, stuff, yes. So.
Oh, um, love it. Yeah, so I was I was really passionate about like sort of teaching Spanish to people, uh, dental Spanish, and so we had like a couple projects that we did. Like I would do like fun little like uh, dental and health Spanish lectures. Um, and then also we made like these little cards, these little cheat sheet cards that people could put on their, um, on their badge reels. And so that they could just refer to them and it had a bunch of dental and medical terms that they could refer to. And, and we like translated the, uh, med dent history form to Spanish. So, so students could read off of it and ask their Spanish speaking patients. So yeah, we definitely, we definitely did a lot of fun things and, uh, with that and, and yeah, yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a fun organization when I was there as well too. Um in your graduating class, were there a lot of Hispanic Latinos? In my graduating class, there was I think probably there were 6 of us out of a class okay, yeah, of uh, yeah. about 106. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, our, ours was probably about the same. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think and then yeah, I, I get kind of lost because I don't remember if uh, a few people were like, Mick, I don't know. But I think we, we were also a handful, for sure less than 10. So like less than 10%, which is Yeah, which is I know crazy. that there was one of the classes, I think maybe like two or years ahead of me, that they had mm-hmm. like maybe 10 or, or 12 uh, Hispanic yeah, that's, people. That's they, were all from the, they were all from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. But I know my class only had one student from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, which is like the, the border, um, area yeah. of, of Texas. And, um, for those who don't know, and, yeah. um, and then we had, uh, yeah, me, I was the only Venezuelan and we had one Cuban and the rest were Mexican American. Yeah. Mm, cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, for you, do you foresee yourself continuing, continuing your involvement with the Hispanic Dental Association? Yeah, I think I'll for sure, for sure, continue my involvement with it. I, I loved, I loved being a part of it. We would go to to a lot of the um, the professional chapter meetings. They would always invite us, and so that was great. I, I loved. I got to meet so many uh, really great dentists in the Houston area that were part of the part of the HDA professional group, and um, and even uh, even my mom was involved with HDA for a time. She like kind of jumps in and out of involvement depending on like how involved some of her dentist friends are at the time and stuff like that. But uh, but yeah, so I definitely will will continue to stay involved. Even a lot of the faculty from UT they were involved, and so sometimes at the professional meetings we got to see them, and it was really cool seeing them outside of school. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, it, I really enjoyed being part of the of that community, and it's definitely something I'll continue to be part of. Because that's what it is at the end of the day. It's like a community. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, in your opinion, why is it important to have organizations like the HDA and representation for Hispanic and Latinos? So for me, I think that the number one that I think is the community aspect of it. Um, one of my friends, she also kind of had similar thinking to me where she was like, I definitely want to. Uh, she's from the Rio Grande Valley. She's one of my best mm-hmm. friends from dental school. She's from McAllen te- or Brownsville, Texas. And she really wanted to um, to go somewhere new. She wanted to leave Texas. She So she decided to move to Chicago. And through the Hispanic Dental Association, she was able to get her two jobs. So she's working at two offices. And both the offices are from dentists that were involved with HDA. And um, she was connected to them through some of her mentors at UT, like Dr. Melcher um, and uh, Dr. Victor Rodriguez. Uh, So they, they got to... So she got to meet these people and she ended up getting hired thanks to the mm. HDA connection. So um, things like that, the networking opportunity, especially like, you know, you're moving to a place that you don't know, you you have the HDA to fall back on. And so it really, really is wonderful. And she's getting to serve a very highly uh, Hispanic community. She's, you know, speaks Spanish and is able to serve that community. And that's very uh, meaningful for her. So um, uh, I think that's the main benefit. You know, a lot of the people, a lot of the dentists that work or that are part, members of the HDA, of course, they're they serve Hispanic communities at a lot of them because they, they speak Spanish and, and so on and so forth. So, um, it's, it's cool to be part of that community. Yes, I, I agree. And so, you know, if, if you're Hispanic Latino and you're a practicing dentist or even a student and you're listening, we, we would really encourage you to get involved in some kind of organized industry, but the student Hispanic dental association, the Hispanic dental association are, are really great ways to uh, kind of give you that introduction of what organized dentistry is, but also to find a community. Cause I think that in dentistry is, as we've spoken about in other episodes, um, it, it can be very lonely. It can be very difficult, but surrounding yourself by a community that can help uplift you, I think can be really helpful. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I know that, um, have you found the Hispanic Dental Association in New York? Because I know they used to be really a part of like the New York, um, the big Greater New York meeting that's held oh, yeah. every every uh, November or so. So no, I have I have not actually connected with the HDA in New York. Um, I I know um, quite a bit of students that I met at that Philadelphia conference, mm-hmm. um, and so it I I definitely like uh, know some people that are involved, but I haven't gone to any meetings or anything like that. I've only been there for three months, but it's certainly something that I'd like to to get involved in actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I forget that that you you pretty much just has started. I feel like you've been there for a while, but I'm just really excited yeah. for you to be in New York. I feel like uh, I know. I know. Right now, so my cool. main my main like uh, involvement has been with the AAPD. You know, since I oh, just yeah. okay, entered the new entered the new profession of pediatric dentistry, I've uh, sort of the conferences and the involvement that my program has sort of you know put us in, and then we've kind of become part of is the AAPD in New York, the Greater New York AAPD chapter, mm-hmm. and, and so on. So yeah, well, rightfully so. Yeah. Well, well, Diego, I, I would love for us to leave um, a message for our, our Spanish speaking listeners. And so, um, mi pregunta para ti es para ti, ¿por qué eres orgulloso de ser hispano latino en nuestra profesión? A mí me da mucho orgullo cuando un paciente me dice, um, wow, doctor, qué bien que hable, qué bueno que habla español. Eh, no, yo, yo cada vez que me veo con un dentista nunca habla en español, qué bueno que usted me entiende todo lo que le digo eh, y pues los pacientes se emocionan tanto y se sienten tan entendidos y se sienten en buenas manos que yo también puedo hablar en español con ellos y eso es muy, eso gratifica mucho. Y, y para ti, ¿por qué es importante tener representación en nuestra profesión de los hispanos y latinos y también tener líderes que son hispanos uh, que, que ayuden a guiar a nuestra profesión? Pues yo creo que hay muchas personas en nuestra comunidad que crecen en hogares, eh, lo cual es muy difícil salir bien en la escuela. Por ejemplo, la, muchos, muchas personas en, en la comunidad latina tienen padres que quizás no tuvieron una mm. educación muy formal, quizás ni siquiera saben hablar inglés. Entonces, imagínese, uno se tiene que imaginar qué difícil debe ser tener padres que no hablan inglés, no los pueden ayudar con las tareas, no los pueden ayudar con estudiar para los exámenes. Es muy difícil eh, estar en esa situación y salir muy bien en la escuela. It's like a big barrier that they face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Entonces, eh, eh, Siendo parte de una comunidad latina de personas con un nivel de educación alto, yo creo que es muy importante que nosotros tenemos que tratar de ayudar la comunidad latina en este país de eh, educarse y tener profesiones como la de nosotros en las áreas de la salud es muy importante. Y así ellos pueden servir a la cantidad de pacientes que, que son hispanoparlantes, hispanos que están en este país. Uh, para mí me da mucho gusto ver a alguien como ti, eh, como tú uh, estás representando nuestra comunidad, tu cultura, uh, especialmente en Instagram, que tienes bastantes seguidores, pero yo pienso que quizás hay muchos que siguen tu página y te ven como un ejemplo para seguir, para poder avanzar, avanzarse y quizás a, a aceptar la profesión o entrar a la profesión para también a convertir, convertirse en dentista. Ojalá, ojalá que sí, me encantaría sí. mucho. Sí, me encantaría mucho. Diego, are any last thoughts for our listeners today? Well, I just wanted to thank you so much, Tanya, for inviting me. It's been so fun. Um, thanks for thinking about me and asking me such great questions. I love, I love being able to share with this community. So, um, yeah, uh, for those of you that um, are interested, uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram, um, Diego.j.rivas, and uh, and. Feel free to reach out with any questions if you are interested in applying to dental school or interested in applying to residency um, or have any sorts of struggles of being a Latino in the um, in the dental community, then please reach out. Yeah, we're, de- we're definitely here to provide some support and, and a network of support. And if we can't help you, I'm sure we can find others to help you. So yeah, uh, please use either Diego and I as a resource to you. Diego, thank you so much again for taking time out of your day to meet with me. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of New Dennis on the Block. If you'd like to connect with Diego, you can find him on Instagram 
at Diego J. Rivas underscore. You can also connect with me on Instagram at tsmaestas.dds. Please be sure to leave a review for the podcast. If you have a new dentist that you'd like to see on the podcast, send a DM to at new dentist on the block on Instagram. We'll catch you next time.